this week on Vaticano. The Catholic Church grows by 15 million new members, according to the latest statistics presented for World Mission Day. Learn about the relationship between the Eucharist and mission from Cardinal Fernando Filoni, and come with us down into the Roman catacombs to witness the faith and courage of the early Christians. For this and more, Vaticano starts now. This October, the church enters into a two-year synodal journey. A mobile prayer app, Click to Pray, is giving the faithful the opportunity not only to walk together, but also to pray together leading up to the synod. With the unveiling of Click to Pray 2.0, the universal church is united, only a click away, and the faithful have a library of prayers at their fingertips for the synod and everyday life. The Holy Father stressed the importance of keeping patients at the center of medicine, speaking to the members of the foundation of the Biomedical Campus University of Rome. Pope Francis said that loving the person allows the image of Christ to shine through. France is celebrating the 100th anniversary of the re-establishment of diplomatic relations with the Holy See. French Prime Minister Jean Castex met with Pope Francis and presented him with a special gift from a fellow Argentinian, a signed Lionel Messi jersey. Messi plays soccer for a professional team in Paris. In return, the Holy Father gave the Prime Minister a mosaic and important texts from his papacy. During the exchange, the two spoke about the situation in the Middle East and the upcoming COP26 meeting. To prepare for World Mission Sunday, the Vatican held a press conference where Cardinal Luis Antonio Tagle, the prefect of the Congregation for the Evangelization of Peoples, spoke about the missionary spirit of the church. We are reminded this Sunday, this uh, World Mission Sunday, that spirituality an encounter with the Lord is always missionary. And mission is always also spiritually grounded in an experience of Jesus. An experience that moves us out of ourselves to share Jesus to all the nations. Cardinal Tagle highlighted Pope Francis' message for World Mission Day, reminding the faithful that we're all called to share our experience of Jesus. We have to share the Lord. We have to share the Lord that we have experienced. Yes, we have our personal experience of the Lord, but it is not for us to keep, to own. It is given to us as a gift to be shared with others. The more we share the gift of Jesus, the deeper our faith grows. On August the 15th, Taliban forces took control of Kabul in a military offensive against the new Afghan government. Nearly one week later, Sister Shanaz Bhatti and her Afghani collaborators were able to flee from the violence and arrive safely in Italy. What I, I am uh, experiencing uh, from there till here is my faithfulness to the church. If we will die, we will die all together. If we will live, we will live all together for the greater glory of God. And that happened. And I'm here. Uh, first few days, I couldn't believe that I was out of that situation because the violence that you had seen on the TV 
I had lived on my on my skin so I, I couldn't be in peace now after some months I am a bit calm I, I am trying to realize that I am here out of that uh, place and I'm safe and secure not everyone will have a testimony like sister Bati who spoke at a prayer vigil in preparation for World Mission Day but as Pope Francis says everyone can contribute something on this day Today is World Mission Day, and with gratitude, I greet the many missionaries. They do so not to proselytes, but to bear witness to the gospel in their own lives in lands that do not know Jesus. Many thanks to the missionaries. The Holy Father, Pope Francis, is a... Father Tadeusz Jan Novak, the Secretary General of the Pontifical Mission Societies, which are a part of the Congregation for the Evangelization of Peoples, explains this year's message. The message of the Holy Father for World Mission Sunday is, we can't help but speak about what we have seen and heard. The key to that is that uh, Christian mission is never proselytizing, trying to gain uh, members of the church by different means. Christian mission is always sharing of faith, sharing the good news, and, and, and giving signs of, of, the, uh, of the presence of Jesus. That's why when missionaries go to uh, countries, they, they have hospitals and, and schools and, and provide health care, not just for Christians, for everybody, because Jesus came for everybody. And that witness of the love of God uh, on the local level, uh, far and near, uh, then uh, opens people's hearts to, to wonder, oh, who, who is this, this Jesus? Even today, um, in, in countries that have been Christian for so long. According to statistics published on World Mission Sunday by the Congregation for the Evangelization of Peoples, the church has grown by 15 million people, especially in African and Asian countries, and vocations to the priesthood are also increasing. In fact, in, in, in mission countries, or what, what the Vatican will designate as mission countries, um, in many of them, uh, there, uh, there, are, uh, there is an increase of, of vocations, um, traditional vocations, uh, to the priesthood, to consecrated life, and so on. Uh, that's part and parcel with, with the reality of young churches, where there is youth, there is energy, and, and there is more uh, desire to, to, to get engaged in life of the church, which means then that, that you will have vocations. I think in, in, in some more developed countries or est more established countries, let us say, where Christianity has been uh, present for hundreds of years, um, in some ways, uh, like the Holy Father says in Europe, there's a kind of a, a tiredness. And, and, and I think what needs to happen is, is a rejuvenation. Uh, the young people need to be challenged um, because the church can challenge to, 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 to values that are very close and deep within the heart of every person. Father Novak encouraged young people to see Pauline Jaricot, the foundress of the Pontifical Mission Societies, as a role model for being everyday missionaries. They can use uh, Pauline as, as an example. I mean, she, she formed this, uh, created this, this, this reality when she was 16, 17, 18 years old. I mean, very young. And she was a layperson. She, she never thought of becoming a, a consecrated religious. Um, so therefore, the, the, the mission uh, um, challenge is open to everybody. La domanda che ogni giorno dovremmo porci. Jari Cot will be beatified next May in her hometown of Lyon, France, where she started the Pontifical Society of the Propagation of the Faith 200 years ago. She was instrumental in developing the missionary work of the Church in the 19th and 20th centuries. This passion for the faith helps people like Sister Shanaz Bati to bring the hope of the gospel to her Afghani families and friends. And it also motivates missionaries in Rome who received a blessing from Cardinal Angelo de Donatis to be sent out to the ends of the earth.
When we return, meet Cardinal Fernando Filoni, Grand Master of the Equestrian Order of the Holy Sepulchre of Jerusalem, as he reveals the intimate connection between the Eucharist and missionary work. From the moment Christ sent out the apostles, the Catholic Church has been living out its missionary life. Today that happens while it builds water wells in Ghana, funds diocesan schools in Bangladesh, and feeds the homeless in the United States. For Cardinal Fernando Filoni, the missionary work of the Church has always been a part of his vocation. From serving in the diplomatic service of the Holy See in Sri Lanka, Iran, and Brazil, to being an apostolic nuncio in Jordan and Iraq, where Christians are persecuted. It must be said that sometimes Christians are losing the taste for the Eucharist. In the missionary world, I have found much love. There are chapels where the Eucharist is perennial, and where Christians, it's interesting, take turns. They organize themselves so the Eucharist always has a presence to relate to. And in our secularized world, a little bit we are losing this reality, this richness, but this can be recovered. Cardinal Filoni says that recovering this Eucharistic love is necessary to avoiding spiritual death, as the Eucharist is a source of mission work. Eucharistic devotion and the missionary spirit are pillars of the Catholic Church. La Chiesa cammina the church walks first and foremost on missionarity. If there is no missionary spirit, the church cannot progress. And therefore, this was the last, and I would say also the first commandment of Jesus. Go and proclaim the gospel. This is irrepressible, this commandment of Jesus, and we receive it as the element that allows us to look beyond. This is where the mission of the church also begins. Cardinal Filoni believes that when one prays with the Eucharist, then the mystery of God's presence in our lives is evident. He sees this as the most beautiful thing the Church can give to others. The Church, in addition to proclaiming, in addition to preaching, in addition to witnessing to charity, celebrates the presence of the living Jesus. Sacramentally, the Eucharist, the highest expression, what is called the summit, the source of the Church's life is the Eucharist. So you cannot separate these two realities. So the Eucharist allows us to say that Christ still accompanies the Church, lives in the Church. The two things are so inseparable that if you wanted to cut one from the other, we would no longer have the Church. The Cardinal argues that though God chose to manifest himself in a specific moment through the Incarnation, he had always been present in man's unique cultures. Therefore, if cultures do not have this leaven of the Gospel, they remain unfinished. We must understand that the mission of the Church in this sense, this service, has this twofold reality. To be Mother, therefore, the Church generates but also teacher, that is, she educates. These two aspects are so intertwined that it would be impossible to separate them. Therefore, if the gospel through the church does not enter cultures, cultures remain unfinished. Missionary work directly works towards this twofold reality. It is intimately tied to the Eucharist and is an essential part of bringing the faith to all nations, as Christ commanded in the Gospels. The question is the following. Can a man live without food? Is it possible to imagine him without nourishment? Is it possible to imagine a faith? I'm not saying religiosity, which is something else. But is it possible to imagine a faith that does not have in itself the mystery of the Eucharist? 
that is nourishment, what Jesus left as a living part with us. It is not only a question of the intellectual type, but of the whole person. The Eucharist touches the whole person. And with the Incarnation and Christ's presence among us, Cardinal Filoni believes that Jesus himself brings the face of mankind to know the Father in Heaven. After the break, join us on the Appian Way as we learn about the archaeology of the Roman catacombs with Professor Javier Domingo. years of history, the city of Rome offers the visitor an extraordinary voyage through the history of man. What not everyone knows is that the eternal city conserves within it the living memory of the first Christians. length and breadth of the Roman underground, more than 50 cemeteries, a network of 150 kilometers of galleries, give life to what we know today as subterranean Rome. We're talking about the Roman catacombs. In recent decades, the interest in these funerary monuments has dramatically decreased. Faced with this situation, Monsignor Pasquale Jacobone, Secretary of the Pontifical Commission for Sacred Archaeology since 2018, proposed a new initiative to reawaken the curiosity of pilgrims. I became a secretary four years ago, and in the moment that I took on this task, the Holy Father named me Secretary of the Commission. I realized that it was necessary to give an input, an impulse to the number of visits to the catacombs. Unfortunately, on Rome's tourist and pilgrim circuits, the catacombs were almost completely forgotten. That's why I came up with a day on which, like for other occasions, the monuments are open for free and are made available to the entire public. I must say that the first time was a great success. We had enormous lines of people who calmly waited their turn to visit the catacombs, especially Romans who had never been. And so, from that first positive experience, this tradition was born, for which every year, around the feast of Pope St. Calixtus, on October 14th, we celebrate this day full of visits and appreciation both in the catacombs, normally open to the public, in Rome there are seven, and especially in other places, normally inaccessible to the public, but that we like to show and open for visits to all who may be interested.
Every day dedicated to the catacomb seeks to give visitors the necessary tools to be able to understand how the first Christian communities lived the faith and died in the capital of the empire. This year, we wish to focus the day on the symbols that mark the root of the catacombs. Also because we realized that these symbols, apparently well known and famous, in reality have become somewhat mysterious and unknown, even among Christians themselves. That is why we wanted the day to underscore and highlight the ancient Christian symbols along the roots in the basilicas next to the tombs. For Monsignor Pasquale Jacobone, in the Paleo-Christian symbols, the pilgrim can recognize the communicative force of the language of current media. I define them as tweets from Christian antiquity. Why? Because there is an exceptional communicative and creative capacity from these Christians who, with few signs, with the most simple signs and essential figures, were able to communicate a world that isn't thought, but from the world of the Christian experience. Two lines are enough to create the first letters of the word Christos, the C-H-I and the R-H-O, to trace back the Christian identity of that tomb of the deceased person in that cemetery. And then, when this symbol is modified, the first letter, the C-H-I, becomes a cross. Therefore, we have the name of Christ, that is, Christ crucified and risen. And so, this is the symbol that shows the hope of the deceased person, his vision of life and beyond life. And in this way, the fish, or the anchor, or so many other symbols, are little, yet essential symbols on a communicative and efficacious level. But they refer to an intensity of Christian life, experience, testimony. Here we are, for example, in the Ipogean Basilica, underground, dedicated to the martyrs Nereus and Achilles. So an experience that often is consecrated with the gift of life, of blood. And so we aren't speaking of ephemeral messages, of empty words or plays on words. We're speaking of symbols connected to a testimony of a courageous, strong life, full of values and meaning. And so reproposing these symbols means helping the young people of today who have Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, to recover the content the message of the symbols. Every time a visitor steps inside the Roman catacombs, they physically access an extraordinary chapter in the history of man. And as Christians, they revive the communicative dimension that nourished the faith of the first Christian communities in the Eternal City. The first question we could ask ourselves is what is a catacomb? The catacombs are the place chosen by the first Christian communities to bury their deceased. We must keep in mind that, contrary to what some traditions have said, the catacombs were not the place where Christians gathered in times of persecution, nor was it the place designed for Eucharistic celebration in these early centuries. They were simply the place where the members of the Christian community were buried. Also, due to the fact that they are labyrinths, you could not enter alone. You had to always enter accompanied by a person who knew the structure, who knew the galleries and how to enter and how to get out. Therefore, it was not a place of free access. The name catacomb derives from a topographical place located on the outskirts of Rome. 
It is a depression that was just outside the city walls in the south, that has a large depression and that place was defined as Ad Catacumbas. Some of the first catacombs were located precisely in this place, and therefore Christians said they went Ad Catacumbas when they went to visit their deceased. In fact, in the following centuries the name will come to define the type of burial. It must also be said that subterranean burial was not an invention of the Christians, but that many ancient peoples already used this system. It is normally a matter of small subterranean rooms or small spaces in a small corridor designed to bury members of the same family or of a more or less large family nucleus, and also professional corporations. But it was always designed for a nucleus, for a very limited group of people. The difference with the Christian catacombs is that these were intended for a very large community of people that grew exponentially over time. This made them have different characteristics from other non-Christian subterranean tombs. For example, richer development in corridor designs, sometimes arranged on different floors, attempted to create new spaces as the Christian community needed more tombs.